We all know that real estate has created more millionaires than any other industry on the planet. We also know that it has created a lot of heartache due to mismanagement, overborrowing, and just simple life events that happen to all of us. Welcome to the Cash Flow Pro Podcast. My name is Casey Brown, and I am your fearless leader. And although we might be bourbon sipping and at times foul mouth Southerners, we will always do our best to be honest, straightforward, and due diligent with all of the information we pass along to you. Welcome to the show. Hey there, and welcome to today's episode of Cash Flow Pro, your daily real estate investing podcast and YouTube channel. I'm here today with Michael Haltman of Hallmark Abstract Services. Michael, how are you today, sir? Doing great, Casey, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk with you. Absolutely, man. We're always intrigued with New Yorkers and try. I don't even think I said that right, but you we're know, always we're always know. intrigued by learning the business um, because, like I said pre-show, you know, we're I myself am of the opinion you either do business in New York or you do business everywhere else, but you don't do both. Um, and it's always because I think part of the reason is is because things change so fast. And I think that's really the main thing about those areas. It's like California. Things change fast. Before you know it, they could be building a sewer plant across the street from a property you loved and you had no idea. And so that's kind of like why it's like, hey, you know, you either focus on learning other markets or you learn there. So tell us a little bit about yourself, um, how you got into business and what Hallmark Abstract Services is. Sure. So. Uh, the way I got into this business is kind of a uh, circular route. I, uh, I started out in my career in the 80s as a uh, bond analyst on Wall Street, specializing in uh, mortgage bonds. Uh, I was then a bond trader, but then I opened up a commercial mortgage lending company in the uh, early 2000s. And we would do uh, small balance commercial loans. I don't know if... Uh, is that the segment that many of your listeners might be in, a million dollars and under? And uh, we would sell our a little more. I just it's going to vary because, see, we, we, we you know, we have some beginning capital raisers and syndicators that might be raising money for a smaller deal. And then, of course, we have people that are up and that are doing 10, 20, 30 million dollar deals, too. So right. they should come to New York. That's right. Well, yeah, especially and that and, and I'll tell you, the political climate though, that's I think what it's like I said, it's not necessarily that they can't or don't want to, but I think there's I think a lot of people are just like, I can deal without that stress. It uh, and it is incredibly stressful. So the uh you know, New York is the kind of state that is very uh like if you take multifamily, very tenant friendly, very landlord unfriendly, and most of you know, the majority of buildings in multifamily at, at any rate are owned by mom and pops. Mm -hmm. So when the legislation completely favors the tenant, the people who are, you know, they bought these buildings for their retirement. And when they are stymied at every turn and can't get rid of tenants who aren't paying, it's a, it's a problem. So it, it's definitely, there are definitely a lot of challenges to New York. No question about it. You know, and I get, I say I get, I'm trying to, I've always tried to wrap my mind around why things are the way they are when it comes to the predicament of these are people's life savings. This is what they've saved. This is what they bought. This is what they worked hard to pay for. And now they can't get rid of a troublesome tenant because they won't pay. And I'm oftentimes what, and maybe you can answer this question. What is the government's stance on that? Are they trying to keep from their the people being displaced into the streets? Are they trying? Obviously, there's some bad eggs in the landlord in the landlord business that are like, you either pay on the first or I'm going to shut your electric off and I'm going to take your front door off. There's those guys. We know that. Well, here's my uh, here's the way I see it, and I, I don't like to get political, especially on a on a podcast, but. You know, typically the politicians, at least in New York and maybe in California, you know, they, they pander for votes. So if you look at the constituency okay. of in New York City, landlords are a very small constituency. 
although they are huge donors to political parties and the tenants are a huge constituency. So, you know, if you had to, if you had to skew your legislation one way or the other, where are you going to go? You're going to go to where, uh, where you think that your bread is buttered. Sure. Sure. Positioning that legislation to give those folks to get those votes across the line makes sense. I mean, and that's really the best way I've ever put it. Cause I never could really figure out. I'm like, you know, because it's like, for instance, it benefits Texas to be heavy business oriented, right? Because they're, I guess, because they have room to expand and they, that the you know, more fa- like infinite numbers of factories basically could come to Texas. Right. And so, and when you're looking at New York and, and it's so scarce right there, like land is so scarce, it just seems to me like, that that's what makes sense. And that's the only thing that would make sense. Well, to be, to be honest, if once you get out of New York City, Long Island, Westchester County, land is not really that scarce. But I think, again, you know, if you look at who runs Texas, if you look at who runs Florida, if you look at who runs New York, and if you look at who runs California, there's there's different political mentalities. And I that's think, right. that, you know, being business oriented, being favorable to business is not a bad thing, but, um, you know, in some places it doesn't fly. Like, I don't, I don't know how much you watch New York, uh, real estate or politics, but there was an opportunity. Are are you familiar with, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? Yes. Yes. So she's the, uh, Congresswoman from Queens Mm -hmm. and, uh, they were going to bring Amazon to Queens to a, um, uh, what's the name of those zones? Uh, you know, the zones where opportunity zone, opportunity zone. Thank you very much. I, I, mm-hmm. I knew it started with an O, but it had huge potential for her constituents, but they were going to give Amazon a tax break. So she fought against it. And all of those jobs and all of that money that was going to go to her constituents, their businesses, that, you know, they just didn't get it. And, you know, that's just a, a function of having to be anti-business. Yeah, yeah. Anti-capitalist in a way. And, of course, now that's definitely not something I'm, I'm afraid to say on here is is that the capitalist mentality is something we all possess and we're all like so. And that's why it's so difficult to really get an idea of, again, because my guests, the majority of my guests are, are, again, they're, they're not, they don't even know anything about how to do business in New York because they're not even going to try. It's it's just, it's, it's like, just forget it. And so with that being said, now I know that, that the abstract services part, uh, title insurance and so on and so forth. And, um, but I really want to get into, I want to ask a, a couple of questions that, that, that could potentially be, be title issues or not that are surrounded around the tenant laws, right? And the first is, is if I have a building that has, uh, like, let's say it's got, I don't know, 20 units in it, right? And it's got two bad egg tenants that just won't leave. They won't pay. They won't do anything. They're there. They get up. They go in. They don't care about anybody. They're there and they're freeloading. Um and I want to sell that building, right? And obviously I have to inform the new owner, hey, I've got these two bad egg tenants. They won't leave. They can't leave. They won't go, whatever. Um, isn't there something, is there anything tied to the title that that would bring along with it? That Because I thought once the title transferred or something like that, then that the process of getting rid of them starts over or something like that. Am I completely, I could have dreamed that up too. <laughs> uh, you know what? It all comes down to whatever the law is in place at the time. You know, if it's a, you really can't. Ju- and I'll give you another little piece of legislation that just failed, but that was proposed, called good cause eviction. And basically, what that said to a, a multifamily owner was, you can't get rid of a tenant unless you can show some very good cause as to why they should be evicted and to the extent that you would have to give them, you would have to extend their lease if they wanted it. You would have to, your rent increases would be very limited. Uh, From a title point of view, getting rid of a tenant 
is is really not our that's not our uh, purview whatsoever. Okay. Well, I, I just, I, again, I thought there was something that tied the two together potentially where, because you kind of inherit whatever it is, but nevertheless, um, so let's talk a little bit about the title and title insurance and how all of that kind of looks up there. And, sure. and um, because I know there's, there's a lot of condominium holds and stuff like that too, right? Like where, I don't know if maybe they... I guess I'm just trying to figure out what all encompasses title and if it's a whole lot different than it is everywhere else. You know what? I don't think it's a whole lot different in terms of what it's protecting. I think it's probably different in terms of the mechanics of how it gets done. You know, okay. New York is a, uh, it's an attorney state. So, you know, you, the attorney drives the bus when it comes to title, he orders the title and, uh, you know, he chooses a title company he wants to use, but in terms of of how it protects the the buyer, I don't think it varies from place to place. Uh, you know, the premiums in New York are relatively high, typically uh, around four grand per thousand. How does that uh, How does that compare to where you are? When you're saying, I'm sorry, four grand per thousand, back up. Uh, of purchase value, of purchase price. So a million dollar, I'm sorry, I, I did not say that right. That's what I was just like, wait. <laughs> 4,000 per million of purchase price. 4,000 per million in order to protect, like get a get an insurable, or to get insure a title, title, right? And that's of yeah. course after you determine that, that the title yeah. is insurable, right? Correct. Once we determine it's, it's free, clear, and all good, then it's four grand per. Million. I think that's probably pretty close. I think, really? I think th there was one that we looked at a, probably been two or three months ago and it was like a 200 or $250,000 purchase. And I want to say it was like 800 bucks or something like that. So it wasn't, it's not wildly different. Now right. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in and make our conversation a little bit more interesting because I want to be sold on this. All right. Okay. I want you to sell me a title insurance policy and I'm going to set, but I'm going to set the parameters of the discussion, right? I'm going to be a devil's advocate because I want, I want some of these questions answered. And I know some of my listeners want these questions answered as well. I've been told, or I've heard it said rather, as a matter of fact, I was just at a real estate conference uh, about a month ago, six weeks ago. And they said, and somebody, somebody there said, title insurance is the biggest scam there ever was. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that. I'm just, I'm setting no, this up. Really and I, my, my initial reaction was why? Because for one, the title, the, the person that's insuring the title has the ability, the physical ability to go back and look at all the records and say, hey, we don't find anything. Of course, we'll insure this title. It's never going to be able to be paid or never going to, it's never going to be paid out. Now, obviously there's some abstract ideas of gas leases and mineral rights and timber, this or that or the other. But my question is, is when you have something there, because typically an insurance policy is insuring us against the unknown. Correct. Where yeah. title insurance, we're insuring against something that we could just go back and research and figure out ourselves. Right. And then the title insurance company won't insure a title that has a question about it because they call it an uninsurable title. So I guess that's where I'm kind of coming from in okay. how and why. And, I, and again, this all just came to me when I was like, how can we make the discussion of title insurance interesting? You know right. Well, let's go. Yeah, so that, sell is, it. that is a good one. Uh, trying to make it more interesting. But why should somebody buy title is something that you often hear. And, and the reason you buy title, and you're 100% correct, it's backward looking. And the issue comes in where things are not knowable. You know, yes, the number of title insurance claims are not many. But when they do arise, you want to be protected because there are, I'll give you a couple of examples. One, there are things that are, are not knowable. You know, my risk as a title insurance company is if I don't 
find something knowable. But in New York in particular, you know, I don't know how the county clerk's offices are where you are, but it's New York City in and of itself is a zoo. And things often do get misrecorded. So while title looks clear, two years later, somebody comes up and says, I have a mortgage on this property. You know, that doesn't happen often, but that is certainly possible. More often, though, you might get something where somebody dies, leaves their house to their kids. You know, there's four kids. Two of the kids sell the house, although they didn't have the right to sell the house. And it becomes a whole, you know, a whole case of the other two come in and they file, they they try and get the, the deal reversed and you get title claims from things like that. So title insurance is not a scam any more than, listen, I have a life insurance policy that's going to run out in a year and hopefully it doesn't pay off. But, you know, is that a scam? I mean, I'm paying for nothing. So title insurance- At the end of the policy, you're paying for nothing, but you paid for it in case you needed it. So it's the same- it could essentially be the same thing of what you're saying. I well, that's my point. Yeah. That's my so, point. so while, you know, if I'm buying a $2 million house and I, I kind of liken it to, uh, you know, a lot of times in New York, someone's going to go with a lawyer who charges $899 because he's cheap. They're buying a $2 million house and don't yeah. want to pay the two grand for a good lawyer. You know, yeah. Yeah. you know, so you don't have to buy title insurance, but is it the smart thing to do given you're probably buying some of the most valuable and most expensive assets you're ever going to buy? So does it pay off often? No. Does it depend what company you use? Because not every company is the same. You know, at the end of the day, you're going to get a title policy at the table, but what went into creating that policy? How good is the title company you're using? You know, that's another thing. What is the burden <coughs> what is the burden put on to determine whether a policy pays out or not? If there is an issue and it can be linked to the potential that somebody committed fraud, but it's only the potential that somebody committed fraud, not nobody knows for sure. Right. What is who is the who is the is the burden put on the claimant to say this is not right? Pay me my money. I did not get a clear title to this piece of property. Or is the is the bur is does the insurance company pay the claim and then no. try to figure out who was at fault? No, the yeah. the the uh, homeowner or commercial property owner files a claim. That claim goes to the claims department at the underwriter. Okay. The underwriter then engages an attorney who is going to do the discovery of the case and then deal with the attorney that the that the borrower has. You know, if they determine that there is in fact a valid claim, <coughs> oh, excuse me, they'll pay. But if they don't feel it, they're going to fight it. Yeah. And I'll tell you something else too. One thing that uh, there's some banks out there, again, of course, I've noticed it with smaller banks that don't give a borrower the choice. They're like, you're buying title insurance and it's going to pay, it's going to pay to us. So there's no question. Sorry about this. That's okay. <coughs> In New York, if you get a mortgage, you're getting title insurance. Yeah. Every bank does that because the title insurance is protecting their collateral. That's right. So if I'm buying a house with a mortgage, I don't have to get an owner's policy, but the bank is certainly going to demand a mortgage policy every time. Yeah. And I'll tell you, one of the things down here, uh, I'd say down here when I'm talking, I'm talking about Kentucky because that's that's the the most the most real estate law that I'm so familiar with is Kentucky, is solely Kentucky. And so when we, the thing that catches a lot of people down here is usually during the foreclosure process. And 
that is that means like if somebody's going through foreclosure, they're getting ready to lose their house, and then all of a sudden they step in and they file bankruptcy. Well, that does you know that prolongs it, right? Well, if the bankruptcy trustee doesn't sue or doesn't litigate all of the potential judge or all of the judgment liens that are out there, they miss one. Like let's say uh, uh, credit credit card one had a lien for eight hundred and twenty seven dollars that they didn't that they didn't, that they just missed. They just didn't look at it. They just didn't get it. Then that policy, that, that lien is still active on that piece of property. It never gets cleared up through the bankruptcy process. And then I go buy the house and my attorney does a, does a title search. Well, somebody's going to file a, a title claim because that lien didn't get released. And I know we noticed that a lot a lot in the state of Kentucky. In other words, that's probably, I'd say if there's 10 cases paid out, I'd say that's probably 9.9 of them is something is that to right? that degree. So it's just sloppy work. By, by somebody. You. But again, right. it also either sloppy work or the human element, I guess. So you're basically ensuring the human element that says this may or may not have something right, right or wrong. So, so in New York, they have a new law that if a foreclosure goes through, the people whose home was taken can come back and fight the foreclosure. So title companies after, I forget the date, but title companies won't insure foreclosures because who's going to insure something where somebody can come back in and contest the foreclosure? So, All right. They won't insure it. They won't insure that transaction. But then, what happens if I buy a foreclosure, then I sell it? Will they insure this transaction? Uh, well, they never no. insure it again if it's ever been a foreclosure. Well, if the new you buy it in foreclosure, you go to sell it to Mister ABC, and he tries to get title insurance. His title insurance company is going to see that it's the product of a foreclosure, and that it can still come back to bite them in the ass. If they didn't they, get uh, cleared up when they were supposed to. Right. So it's another, uh, it's another one of those laws with unintended consequences. You got to love those. Yeah. And the, 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 the laws of unintended consequences. Yeah. That, that seems to be, but man, you know, entitled title insurance is one of those things where, where, I was going to say like 9,999 times it doesn't pay, but that 1,000th of a time that it does pay, like it would be priceless. Yeah. Because, I mean, unless it's, of course, it's a thousand dollar problem, like what I just, uh, what I just said here. But so with that being said, I mean, obviously determining the circumstances is probably the first step in determining whether or not you need, title insurance or whether or not you want to get it quoted or look at, look at the different options that there are. Now, <clears throat> is there, is there a time limit? Like if I come in and buy a title policy for my house, one, two, three main street, how long is that protected for? What, I mean, what happens if somebody goes back and, and let's say I got a 30 year mortgage, right? And I'm 28 years and I about got that bad boy paid for. Um, and then I find out that, well, I didn't never did own the house. And I say, all right, well, I bought title insurance. How long does that title policy stand good for? Your, your title, your owner's policy, not the Correct. mortgage policy, but your owner's policy is good for as long as you own the house. Is the mortgage policy cheaper? You know what? The mortgage policy is cheaper, but if you only buy the mortgage policy, and then it's more expensive. You get a break on the mortgage premium when you also get an owner's policy. Gotcha. So for people who say, you know what, I'm not going to get the owner's policy. Well, if they're getting a mortgage, there's not that much difference if they don't get the owner's policy. Yeah. Hi, this is Casey Brown, host of the Cashflow Pro podcast and YouTube channel. Have you been thinking about investing in real estate, but just don't know where to begin? I'd like to help by inviting you to check out our website at www.3000capital.com. There you will find an array of material that will help you learn all about real estate syndication. And while you're there, be sure to check out our free video series download titled 
five must know keys to success in passive real estate investing. I'd also like to personally thank you for making Cashflow Pro part of your day. Now, back to the show. Well, I can tell you that I've said in many, 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 many closings where, because they put, they, they put the, the sales presentation, the title companies that we've dealt with, they put the sales presentation on the attorney that's closing or the title agent that's closing the property, right? And I would say with my high percentage, again, going with numbers nines, I would say 9.9 times out of 10, that attorney or that agent says, uh, this is where you have to decline title insurance. If I thought you needed it, I would tell you. So then they, the, 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 the buyer or the buyer just declines it and then goes from there because ultimately at the end of the day, I mean, I got to feel like some of those attorneys have errors and omissions, right? So is it, I guess if, if it's a, if it's something that they signed off on and said, Hey, this has got a clear title, what, what, which policy would pay? That's a good question. I don't think the, uh, well, the title company is creating and doing the work, not the necessarily, the attorney is supposed to review the policy, but it's my company that creates the policy. And I have errors and omissions as do well. Do you create it after the attorney does a title opinion? Like, do you ever get, are you privy no. to the title <laughs> opinion? Uh, I mean, basically we're providing the, we provide the, the, in New York, the attorney generally doesn't do anything in regards to title. Really? Okay. We, we, we do everything. We send him the completed policy. He should review it and comment on anything he thinks might not be right. But yeah, the attorney, the attorney is really not involved. He's only involved in New York in terms of picking the company that he's going to use but not really, not really in terms of doing anything with the See, policy. See, in Kentucky, the attorney or the title agent does the title search. Then yeah. if they're getting a, a mortgage, specifically a VA or FHA or one of, one of a USDA or one of those types of mortgages, then that, that closing agent gets the request from whatever bank is providing that loan to ask the owner if they want a title policy. So that's where, where I'm saying is, is if, is if the attorney says, Hey, I don't really think you need this. If you'll, you know, but if you'd like it, here it is. Um, obviously that's the attorney taking on a bit of risk, but at the same time, I guess what I'm getting at is, is if the attorney gives me a title opinion that says, Hey, this title is clear. I haven't found anything to tell me different versus him giving me that and myself buying insurance. Obviously you're getting the full faith and credit of whatever insurance company that is versus a, an errors and omissions policy that may or may not pay. Um, I guess that's where I'm just trying to see. That's interesting. So in New York where we're not necessarily the most trusting people in the world, but attorneys here will typically, if their clients say we don't want to buy an owner's policy, we'll make them sign an affidavit. That to says that. that. Okay. They're, so it's not, you know, the attorney is never going to say, listen, I think you're okay. You don't need to buy title insurance. I, I don't think that ever happens sure. because, and, 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 and as I said, the, the reverse is true where they say they make them sign saying that they chose not to get title insurance. Yeah. Because, listen, nobody want. I'm surprised that an attorney would would go out on that kind of a limb. Because in that case, it probably would go against his E and O because the buyer is relying on his on his or her. Yeah. So that's what I've always done. That's what I've always been. I, I was just, you know, you're paying a closing agent four hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, seven hundred dollars to do a title exam. And then you turn it around and pay in seven, eight, nine hundred or thousand dollars for a title insurance policy when they're both tied to they're both tied to an insurance company somewhere. And that was always kind of my issue with it was saying, hey, are we double insuring here or what, you know, what what are we doing? Um, so anyway, but that's that's kind of, I guess, the, the long and the short of my questions for for title insurance and, and the, the, the certainly, like I said, I think the circumstances that surround a lot of different things, especially, and again, I would advise anybody, the listeners listening, don't take any of thing that 
Mike and Michael and I have said as like the gospel as far as your state goes, because I think this is a state by state deal. And there's there's no obviously doubt. different different nuances as you move from state to state in in the uh, right. way title is done and and, the, and of course the open and close of escrows and so on and so forth so anyway well michael thank you so much for being with us today and i think we've done our best to make the conversation of, of title insurance at least somewhat interesting and and uh, you know what I, I kudos to you casey you know what that's not an easy thing to necessarily do but Good well, job. you know, but, and I thank you. You know, we have we have discussions on here. Everybody wants to talk about the capital raising or the deal, and they want to know how to find one or the other, right? But I had an attorney on here not long ago talk about trusts, talking about setting up, uh, uh, you know, uh, asset protection, and 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 the kind of stuff that that basically like like it's not sexy, it's not fun, it's not like this badass topic you get to go out and talk about crushing and taking down uh, these big monstrous apartment buildings, but it's something that if you're not paying attention to and thinking about, especially as you scale and grow, it can kick your damn legs out from under you fast as you got up. And that's the end of it. You know what, to put it, to put it in real estate terms, you need a good foundation with strong nuts and bolts. Yeah. And that's all, the non, that's all the non-interesting stuff, but you do need to cover those bases. Yeah. And that's what we try to do. We try to cover everything through the timeline of of identifying a deal and taking that deal full cycle and selling that deal on the other side and everything that has to take place or potentially take place in between. Again, some of the stuff that, that some of the common threads that holds it all together is, you know, crap. Some of it is very interesting and some of it is just, the, you just want to say, I mean, who the hell wants to have a lunch and discuss asset protection, right? Um, right. But at the end of the day, all really important. That's right. Exactly right. So, all right. Well, listen, I ask a couple of questions to every guest that comes on the show. And the first question that I have for you today is, what is the best book that you have recently read or are currently reading? Uh, Think and Grow Rich. Ah, Think and Grow Rich. I love that book. Napoleon um, is ill. What's his last name? Hill, I think, isn't it? Napoleon Hill, maybe something like that. Yeah, I think that might be it. <laughs> a great book, excellent be. book, and yeah. and that's definitely um, a good way to uh, to put it. Uh, think and grow rich. I mean, there we go. That's what we're doing here, right? Uh, what is the exactly. what is a dream vacation that you've either taken or hope to take? I'd like to go to Normandy and walk the beaches where the uh, where the landing was. Very interesting. Very interesting. That's a bucket list. Item. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. A, and I'm sure a quite somber place at that. Um, just, I think we've all been there with Saving Private Ryan. And at least uh, I know I was in the movie theaters where. Um, yeah, just, just, uh, I mean, that, that's the only word I could really even come close to saying unimaginable would be. Yeah. And the, and the greatest generation is disappearing. Yep. Yep, they're they're nearing their end. That's for sure. Uh, my grandfather's been yep. gone for many years now, probably damn close to thirty. Well, he has been gone thirty years. Thirty years last month, and um, you know that's that's and he he was one of the ones that died young. Uh, so it's so you're right. I mean, it's definitely uh, they're they're definitely become fewer and fewer. So awesome. Well, you know, actually, one quick thing. So I was at the, I don't know if you ever heard of the Nassau Coliseum. It's on Long Island. But they were uh, they were christening their eternal flame for veterans, mm -hmm. and I had the honor of meeting one of the soldiers who was at the base of the hill when they raised the flag at, on Iwo Jima. Oh man! So that was my goodness. Time. What year was that? You would oh when they yeah. when I met this guy, it's probably about five or six years oh, wow. ago. So interesting. Yeah, hopefully. He, Hopefully he's still alive. Very, very interesting. Well, awesome. Well, listen, uh, uh, Michael, we have some listeners. I, I pay attention to a little bit to where our downloads are coming from. We have a, actually, we believe it or not, we have a pretty sizable listener listener base in New York. Um, I think simply because we cover so many of the, the syndication 
laws and rules and, and ideas and capital raising because that's a lot where some of these ideas were born. And again, right. the SEC right. being who regulates a lot of what we do. Um, but I'd like for you to share with our listeners how they can get in touch with you if they have questions. Obviously, if there's something sure. they can that they can use your services for in New York, I sure would like for them to reach out and get in touch with you. So how can they do that? That's phenomenal. So my email address is mhaltman, H-A-L-T-M-A-N, at hallmarkabstractllc.com. And my phone number is 646 741 Six one oh one. There you go. No prank calls. I'm watching you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Very much, yes, sir. Jason. Listeners, if you would, please head down and leave us a five star review and also type a review so that others may know what we talk about here on the Cash Flow Pro podcast. And again, Michael, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, 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 I almost forgot. Hit the subscribe button. Smash the subscribe button because we want to notify you every time we release a new episode because we've got a lot of great content coming. We've been through a lot of great content and we want to teach you everything you need to know about how to write, how to raise capital, how to make real estate the center of your financially free life. So, Michael, again, thank you so much. And listeners, thank you so much. I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the day. Cashflow Pro is hosted by Casey Brown, founder and CEO of 3000 Capital, a commercial real estate investment firm committed to providing its investors with ongoing cash flow and helping them build long-term wealth. If you enjoyed today's podcast, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you'll be notified about all our future episodes. You can find more information about us and our investment philosophy by clicking the link in the show notes below. Thanks for listening.